All right, we're going to go ahead and get started since it uh, looks like a number of folks have joined now and we're a little bit after four o'clock. So welcome to uh, today's Soil, Water and Climate Department seminar. My name is Kelly Wells. I am a research scientist in the department and I co-organized the seminar along with Vasudha Sharma. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to note that um, our next seminar will be one week from today on October 20th. It will also be over Zoom, and it will be uh, Dr. Kathy Klink from the Department of Geography, Environment, and Society uh, here at the University of Minnesota, and she'll be talking about her work on wind climatology uh, at the Rosemount Wind Energy Research Field site. Uh, but today I have the honor of introducing Dr. Francina Dominguez. She is an assistant uh, associate professor in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Illinois. Uh, she has a BS in civil engineering from Universidad de los Andes in Colombia and her MS and PhD in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Illinois. Uh, as a hydroclimatologist, her work is focused on the interactions between the land and the atmosphere, and more specifically on changes in hydrology and climate due to human modification on the land surface and greenhouse gas emissions. And the two primary lines of research in her group look at land atmosphere interaction from two perspectives. The first is the effect of climate variability and change, primarily extreme events on surface hydrology, and the second is the effect of changes in surface hydrology on climate. So today she is going to talk about hydroclimate of the Americas, land surface effects on the overlying atmosphere. So go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? We can, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. So um, as Kelly just mentioned, uh, my work has these two branches. And here I'm going to talk about the latter branch, which is the effect of the land on the atmosphere. Um, so here, okay, so um, as Kelly mentioned as well, uh, I was born in Colombia, South America, uh, specifically in Bogota. And I did my uh, master's and PhD here at the University of Illinois, but in the civil engineering department. And then I moved to uh, Arizona, where I was a postdoc and then uh, an assistant professor. And then I moved here uh, five years ago um, uh, to the Department of Atmospheric Sciences. So uh, I think a lot of the a lot of my life experiences have infused my research. So I'm going to try to kind of weave that into my talk today. So. Uh, why do we study land atmosphere interactions? So the first reason that I'm interested in this is predictability, predictability in the climate system. So this figure here on the left is by Mariotti et al. And essentially she, she uh, lays down the, the sources of predictability for the climate system at the shorter time scales we're talking about Kind of weather, weather phenomenon from the atmosphere at very long time scales, the ocean is the most important source of predictability, but the land occupies kind of this sweet spot between the two. So by storing water in the soil where the time scales are of variability are much longer than in the atmosphere, we can tap into this source of predictability. The second reason why I'm interested in this is because as humans, we have profoundly changed the land surface. Nearly one third of the global land cover has been modified for human consumption. And this is an image that I'm showing here is from the Amazon. Um, and as I told you before, so I'm from Colombia and part of the Amazon is within Colombia. So this is a topic kind of uh, close to my heart. Um, so let's kind of talk in general about how changes in the land surface can modify the overlying atmosphere. So when you have radiation coming to a surface, that surface can affect how much shortwave radiation is reflected back through kind of the albedo of the surface. It can also uh, affect how much longwave radiation uh, is emitted. 
I'm not going to focus on those two in this talk. I'm going to focus on these three, which are the effects of the land surface on moisture, on sensible heat, and on the roughness. And more specifically, I'm interested on how these three kind of changes at the local scale can affect continental scale circulation. So I'm interested kind of at, at large, large scales. So I'm gonna begin with moisture. And here, this is a depiction of how I'm thinking of moisture. And it's essentially how uh, evaporation and transpiration from a particular region gets transported in the atmosphere and then contributes to precipitation in regions downwind. So that's the, the way that I'm approaching this problem. So specifically, you know, if you have rain in a region which you measure with, I don't know, a tipping bucket gauge, you don't, you don't really know from that water what was the origin. So you need other methods like numerical methods or even isotopes to figure out where that precipitation comes from. I'm using numerical methods and specifically I want to know how much of that precipitation came from terrestrial sources, from evaporation from a region uh, upwind. Um, and so that's kind of what, what I focused on for my PhD. So I was, again, I studied here at the University of Illinois Civil Engineering Department. Um, and actually, Professor Tracy Twine was in my PhD committee, um, where the idea in my PhD was to develop this numerical model that allows us to know how much of the rainfall within a particular region comes from recycling from within that same region. Um, several years later, uh, my graduate student Alejandro Martinez improved this model. And uh, with his um, analytical improvement, we now can uh, delineate different regions that contribute to precipitation in a particular point. So if I'm talking about, I don't know, precipitation in the Amazon forest, I can figure out how much comes from other regions, the Atlantic uh, or other terrestrial regions. So after I completed my PhD, I moved to the University of Arizona as a postdoc. And in Arizona, sorry, in Arizona, um, the North American monsoon is a really big deal. So I'm talking so about this region, Southwest U.S., Northwest Mexico. And if you, what I'm showing here on the right is precipitation and uh, moisture fluxes, total moisture fluxes in the atmosphere. And so this is the signature of the North American monsoon. And this is really important for ecosystems, for water resources in the region, particularly in Northwest Mexico. Uh, but it's really difficult to predict. There's a lot of lingering questions about monsoonal precipitation. And one of them is, what are the sources of the North American monsoon? So it had long been assumed that essentially the moisture for the monsoon came from the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf of California, so oceanic sources. And um, what uh, we did along with my student Juan Sui Hu was that we used this model, the DRM model that I had developed to figure out what are the sources of the monsoon. So with the model, you can get like climatologies of moisture sources, like a heat map. So the way you interpret something like this is, you know, this red region is where most of the monsoonal precipitation comes from. And you have like all this other these other regions that contribute to precipitation. And something super interesting that uh, she found was that indeed you have the Pacific, which includes, so this would be the Pacific, the, it includes the Gulf of California. So you have the Pacific contributing to monsoonal precipitation and the Atlantic, so sources from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but you have a very big land component. So what this is saying is that the moisture uh, falls on land and then gets recycled and then con and contributes to monsoonal precipitation, particularly during the peak of the season where 38% of the rainfall is coming from terrestrial sources. 
Something else that we found was that there's this kind of northward progression. So think about it as hopping of moisture from kind of southern Mexico, Central America, and then it kind of hops north. Uh, so that was another pretty cool finding from, from this work. Now, again, kind of following this idea of kind of moisture hopping or moisture cascading, um, we found that the this is this is some work that I did previously. So you have the the water that is in the southwestern United States, and I wanted to see then what happens? Where does it go afterward? And we have this map where you see that the moisture from the southwest a very significant amount of it just gets re-evaporated and travels downwind um, all the way to the central and eastern part of the US, even a little bit of Canada. However, during periods of drought, you of course have less water. So this would be severe drought in the Southwestern United States. Um, then you have kind of this contraction of that plume. Um, and then after you have a bit of a rebound in the, in the drought, you can again see increased moisture export to other regions. So what that means is that anomalies in a particular region can propagate in space to other regions. This idea was then kind of taken and run with by uh, Julio Herrera Estrada and Tirtan Carroy recently. And so what they were doing, they used the same model, this analytical model, uh, to understand in the Midwestern United States. First of all, where does the water come from? Where does water from precipitation come from? And do anomalies upwind contribute to drought periods in the Midwest? And so here, what uh, they're showing, this is the spatial propagation of drought onset. This is August 2011 to 2012. So they're specifically interested in this 2012 Midwest drought. And what they find is that decreases in moisture from upwind land areas accounted for 62% of precipitation deficit during the 2012 Midwest drought. So this really kind of interesting idea of how moisture anomaly, like drought propagation in space and time. So this is pretty recent work that, that was done uh, by this group. Okay, so my talk says in the Americas, so I'm gonna shift focus from North America to South America. And again, I'm showing the precipitation and the vapor transport for South America. Now the wet season there is December, January, February, the warm season. Um, and you see kind of this strong moisture inflow from the Atlantic coming into the continent, crossing the Amazon River, and then kind of impinging on the Andes here. So these are the Andes of tremendous uh, orographic barrier. So that veers the flow south and east. And you have this huge plume of, of precip, this huge uh, precip signal uh, in the Amazon, in the Amazon region. So I'm, not, I'm gonna talk later about the Amazon, but first, uh, our, our first study was focused on the La Plata River Basin. So this is the one down here. It's uh, downwind from the Amazon. And something that's super interesting about La Plata is that most of the water for this basin comes from terrestrial sources. So either from the Amazon upwind or from La Plata Basin itself or other terrestrial basins. And 37% of its rainfall comes from the oceans. So again, this, this region is very dependent on terrestrial evapotranspiration for its precipitation. It's also a super important agricultural region. Um, soy and corn, so it's actually similar to our uh, Midwest region here. And what I'm showing here is essentially you have uh, the precipitation for the basin. Uh, and this black line is how much of that precipitation comes from terrestrial sources. And then all these other lines are kind of specifically which 
which regions are important. Um, and as I said, the Amazon and in particular the Southern Amazon and the La Plata Basin itself are very important sources of moisture for that basin. Now, uh, while I was in Arizona, something very important that happened was that I began to use the weather research and forecast tool. So this is a, a regional atmospheric model, um, which is used uh, mostly in weather analysis, but also in climate. And uh, because evapotranspiration is so important for a lot of these regions in South America, we really need to get the evaporation and transpiration correctly in the model, right? It's super, it's, it, uh, a lot of the water in the atmosphere is gonna depend on terrestrial evapotranspiration. And something that the models do not, did, well, did not account for uh, correctly was the groundwater. So traditionally the models would look like this, so like a free drainage lower boundary condition. Um, and what we did was to incorporate groundwater dynamics into the weather, into WARF, the weather research forecast tool. And what happens is when you add groundwater, you have, um, uh, uh, and you have a reduction in the drainage, of course, and you have soil moisture that can be replenished from below. Um, you also have lateral redistribution of shallow groundwater. So in a continent like South America, this is very important. What I'm showing you here is the depth of the water, the water table depth throughout the continent. And Oh, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the color bar, but the blue are regions that have water table depth within the two meters, so accessible for most plant roots. And, um, and then the deeper ones here in orange are in the Andes below 80 meters, so a very deep groundwater. So again, we incorporated groundwater into wharf, and then we wanted to see what was the effect on the atmosphere. So um, what I'm showing you here is the difference, so the change in different variables when you add groundwater. These are uh, long-term runs, 20-year runs. So um, when you add groundwater, you increase the soil moisture, right? That I, just, I, I told you that, that it'll increase the soil moisture because you have this new kind of source of water for the soil. You're also increasing evapotranspiration because the plants now have access and, and you also have direct uh, bare soil evaporation. Um, but then what happens in the atmosphere? You're gonna change the thermodynamics of the atmosphere. And this is one variable, the lifting condensation level, which is gonna tell you something about the probability of rain. And then the last one is change in total precipitation. So you have increases. So anything blue is increases. So you see a noisier signal for the precip, but particularly down here, you see an increase in total precipitation. And an interesting thing is that you have more precip coming directly from recycling of this water, but you also have a change in the thermodynamics of the environment. So the environment is more likely to produce rain. So you have these two things, in enhanced instability, and you have recycling that's contributing to more rain. Okay, so at the beginning of the talk, I said that we, I developed this analytical model, so this equation, to figure out where water is coming from. But then I also started working with WARF, which is a regional climate model. So what um, we began using was this tool that Gonzalo Miguez Macho and his group developed, where they put tracers directly inside of WARF. So um, you have here, uh, essentially, it's like putting like a dye in the water that evaporates from a particular region from the model and following it in space and time. So it's a really nice uh, way to look at, at uh, moisture sources for precipitation and they're embedded within the model itself. So 
we did 10 uh, year simulations at 20 kilometer resolution, 40 vertical levels. We included the groundwater because we've shown that this was important. Um, and these are other physics schemes that we uh, used within the model. And I do want to say one more thing that this is um, a lot more realistic than the initial model that I had developed during my PhD, because it includes more physical processes, including change of phase in the atmosphere. So that first model, I have to make a lot of assumptions to be able to get to a mathematical formula. Uh, but here I don't have to because all of the uh, all of these equations are embedded within WARF. So we tagged the moisture from the Amazon. Um, remember that when I had started my PhD, I was I really wanted to get at this question of um, recycling in the Amazon forest. And what here, what we find, sorry, I'm gonna move this a little bit, um, is that what, what I'm showing you here is the recycling ratio. So what that is, is, for each one of the pixels inside of this basin, I'm telling you how much of the moisture comes from the basin itself, okay? So this ranges from zero in the yellow to 50% here in the dark blue. And this is for uh, the wet season, the dry season, and the annual average. Uh, so couple of things are super clear, right? You have this spatial gradient where the recycling is increasing as you move into the continent and you get to the barrier of the Andes and that's where you get a lot of recycling. So about you know 40 to 50% of that water that falls on the Eastern flank of the Andes is of Amazonian origin. And this is one of the rainiest places on earth right here. That's one of the rainiest places on earth. And half of that water is coming from the Amazon forest. You also see that uh, there's more recycling during the dry season. Um, and this was actually work that also uh, showed something similar from the University of Minnesota. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, share a nice uh, video that we did here with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. I'm working with a visualization expert called David Bach. And we also have three musicians uh, that have uh, helped to provide music for this visualization. And I do wanna highlight that this is data sonification. So we actually provided time series to the musicians and they did music partially based on these time series. The diurnal beating of the Amazonian hydroclimate. The Amazon rainforest is the largest and most biologically diverse ecosystem in the planet. Moisture-laden tropical winds from the Atlantic Ocean bring precipitation to the rainforest. The dense canopy then transpires and contributes water for precipitation downwind. The Weather Research and Forecast Model, or WARF, is used to trace moisture originating from the Amazon rainforest. By visualizing the output, we show for the first time that the diurnal cycle of transpiration provides a clear diurnal signal to the overlying atmospheric water vapor and can be visualized as a beating over the Amazon. The tracer humidity, or vapor coming from the Amazon, is highlighted in colors ranging from purple to light green. The white lines show the total water vapor carried by the winds at 1.5 kilometers above the surface, or total water vapor flux. While the green lines show the water vapor flux only of Amazonian origin, we will present results for a three month period from December 2004 to March 2005. As you watch the video, notice the beating pattern. This is the diurnal cycle.
Okay. Sorry for the abrupt change. Um, hope you enjoyed that. So in conclusion, in the part of moisture transport, um, many regions in the Americas depend on terrestrial sources of moisture. Um, and one of the implications is that moisture progresses in space throughout the region in time and space. And this can lead to propagation of moisture anomalies or drought propagation as we're studying now. Another implication is that we really do need appropriate representation of subsurface and surface hydrology because this will translate into the atmosphere. Now, my second vignette is sensible heat. So sensible heat, if you have total radiation coming into uh, a region, part of it will go into latent heat, so moisture. Part of it will go into sensible heat, right? The actual temperature changes. So if you have a region where there's very high sensible heat, usually because there's dry soil moisture, you're going to have increase in temperature, and this will create a low pressure above that surface if it's um, kind of large enough. And this, the low pressure can affect the low level uh, wind and hence the moisture fluxes. And so here I'm depicting what would happen if you have a low pressure over the southern hemisphere. You have to kind of flip your coordinate system. Um, and so its effects on low level winds and moisture fluxes. So Again, I'm looking at the La Plata Basin. So now I'm shifting here to the La Plata, not the Amazon anymore. And if you think about the, the dominant pattern of variability, so how uh, soil moisture uh, varies within the year. So this is uh, intra-seasonal variations of, of hydroclimate. There's a very clear dipole um, within the La Plata Basin, where if it's wet here, it'll be dry down in the south and vice versa. So this dipole pattern that tends to, to happen. So uh, my student Devyansh Chug wanted to figure out if this dipole could then generate hydroclimate variability later in time. So what happens a month after you generate this dipole? And we used observations and a statistical technique called GIFA. And what we, uh, what, what he found, what Devyansh found was that one month after this dipole happened, uh, you get kind of the signature in the atmosphere is that you have higher latent heat in the wet part, right? You have higher latent heat and you have lower sensible heat. Conversely, over the dry part, you have less latent heat and more sensible heat. And then this, as I told you kind of in the, in the first cartoon, you create uh, changes in surface pressure with higher pressures over here and lower pressures over here. And you're also changing the vertically integrated moisture fluxes. So you have this low pressure system and think of it as kind of a vacuum, but you also have to include Coriolis. So you have, you have this low pressure system kind of bringing in um, moisture from the subtropics and the tropics. And this is actually generating more precipitation the month after, okay? So this is kind of a different way to think about this. What I'm saying is that dry anomalies in the land surface are leading to more precipitation the month after. And he, Devyansh had this hypothesis, again, that you have higher, so dry soil moisture anomalies, uh, higher temperatures, you generate a surface low pressure system, and that low pressure system is going to enhance the low level jet that's coming in from the north, okay? Um, so just like we have a low level jet here in the plains, they have a low level jet that's coming from the north, from the Amazon, from the Amazon and from the Atlantic. Okay, but this is done based on observations and statistics, right? 
to really figure out if there's a causality, we need to uh, additional techniques. So what we have been doing is that we've been using a global climate model called CSM, and we, we can play with the model. So we can alter the soil moisture and figure out what happens when you have drier conditions in a region uh, versus the control simulation. And this was part of my student Carolina Vieri's master's degree. And currently my student Chu Chun Chen is, is doing similar work. And what we find is that depending on the exact location of the dry soil moisture anomaly. So here I'm showing you the, the, the where we are drying. So this is the brown is where we're drying either in the Western side or in the Eastern side. So if you have, enhanced drying here, you are generating a low pressure system there. And this is the effect on the moisture fluxes. So, so this kind of idea that the dry soil moisture is enhancing the southward extent of the low level jet and the blue is denoting convergence. So you're, you're bringing that air, that moist air down and it's converging into this region generating more precip there. If we put the dry soil moisture here, the effect is a little bit different. We're gonna shift the low level jet to the north and you're gonna have convergence here to the north of the region. Um, so the, the uh, anomaly and precipitation is gonna depend on where exactly you put this low level uh, dry anomaly. But this is a really interesting concept of how large scale uh, dry soil moisture can affect the circulation. Um, and we have not studied what happens in North America, but um, there might be a similar effect. Okay, so what happens when a natural surface is replaced by crops? So this basin, the La Plata Basin, far exceeds the Amazon in terms of hydroelectric production. And I told you that it's important for agriculture and livestock. Um, and over the past decades, there's been a conversion to crops, annual crops, particularly soy. So in 2018, I had uh, I was lucky enough to participate in the Relampago field campaign, uh, where a group of uh, scientists went, went to uh, observe some of the most intense storms on Earth that happen in Argentina in this basin. This is a spread in the New York Times and with a massive storm that one of the ones that we saw during the campaign. And there were many different groups. There were groups related to convective initiation, severe weather, upscale growth, electrification. And my job was the hydrometeorology. Um, so we went there and had, um, sorry, had uh, flux towers in the region. We also measured stream flow, but I'm just gonna talk about the flux towers and two of them. So, from my perspective, something very interesting that happens in this region that has happened is that stream flow has increased, particularly due to base flow. So that slow part of the stream flow that is fed by groundwater. We also see that the water table is getting closer to the ground, okay? So it was about 11 meters in the 70s, so 11 meters below ground in the 70s, and now it's close to two meters, some years one meter below the surface. So shallowing of the groundwater. There has been no change in precipitation, in mean precipitation over this region, okay? So no discernible change in precip. So that's not causing these changes in the hydrology. What has happened is that there has been a dramatic change from pastures and perennial grasses to soybean and other annual crops. So what I'm showing you here in green are, is the um, extent of pastures in this one experimental site that we're analyzing uh, from the 1970s to now. So basically from the majority of the landscape to basically nothing and crops from about 20% to nearly the entire area. So we 
as I said, there was an experimental site. We put a flux tower over alfalfa and right by it, uh, not right by it, but close to it, there was a uh, flux tower over soybean. And we measured it for 10 months. We measured the fluxes for 10 months. And in green are the, are the latent heat fluxes or the evapotranspiration from the uh, green is alfalfa and gray is soy. So you have higher evapotranspiration and latent heat from the alfalfa, particularly uh, before the soy is at its most active. Uh, then you have almost the same, but really during uh, September through December, you have much higher uh, transpiration from soy. Remember, this is the Southern hemisphere, okay? So you have to kind of, um, uh, that the growing season for uh, soy begins in November until, and I think they harvest in, in March. March or April. So if the water in the soy is, uh, is not going into latent heat, it's going to sensible heat, okay? So you're gonna get warmer temperatures um, at, at the surface uh, because you're not having that change of phase. So here in gray, you see the much higher sensible heat over uh, soy soybean than over alfalfa. So what happens? So we're, we use um, the NOAA and P model to kind of extend this. We only have one year of simulation of observation. So we extend this using the model um, and try to kind of figure out, okay, we have this uh, latent heat, sensible heat, how much of the total budget is uh, goes to each one. So we see here that for alfalfa, about 75% of the energy goes into latent heat and about 25 goes into sensible heat. Whereas for soy, you have uh, about 60% going into latent and 41% going into uh, sensible heat. This also changes the recharge. So how much water goes into the aquifer is much larger over soy. And you also have more surface runoff. So this is kind of a schematic of, of what happens when you change, go from alfalfa to soy, deeper water table, you have um, deeper water table and more ET over soy, shallower and more sensible heat over uh over the, sorry, this is the soy and this is the alfalfa. So very dramatic change in the hydrologic cycle and in the energy fluxes at the surface. And of course, this is for one point, right? But these are changes that we're seeing throughout the continent where soy area has increased by 175%. Uh, so very large increase in, in soy crops in Argentina. So what happens when you have this very large change in the properties of, of the land surface? What, what happens when this is extended over a large area? So this is done using WARF, and we see that we have an increase in the soil moisture, decrease in the evapotranspiration, increase in temperature, and increase in sensible heat when you go from alfalfa to soy. Just this is exactly the same as what I just showed you, but just for a large area in space. Then when we look at the effect on IV integrated vapor transport, we see this, we see this uh, um, increase in the moisture transport coming down into this region. Remember that we're modifying the land surface here. Okay, but you see this large scale change in the integrated vapor transport. And we're also seeing some changes in precipitation, although they're pretty noisy. Um, and the problem is that the 15 kilometer resolution can't really resolve a small scale convection. So we need to go to higher resolutions to get a better picture of what's happening here. So, Finally, for my, this is the second part, um, large scale soil moisture anomalies in South America can shift the location of the low level jet. And this has implications at the subseasonal scale, but also it has implications at longer time scales because of this massive land use change that's been happening over the region. 
This is the my last and shortest vignette, which is related to surface roughness. And here I'm going to focus in the on the Amazon, where you have large trees that have been deforested and changed to different types of crops. And what happens is that you're essentially really you're really changing the the roughness of the atmosphere above it. Okay, you're going from kind of rougher atmosphere to smoother. Uh, a, a smoother surface. So here, I'm going back again to kind of where it started, right? I, I started with this question about what happens when you deforest the Amazon. And um, the Amazon is the largest tropical rainforest in the world, hosts 25% of global biodiversity, and it's being rapidly transformed for human production. This is this uh, red areas here are projected deforestation scenarios for 2050. So what uh, is might happen in the future? And this is a business as usual scenario. So sorry, and we have the wharf model, right? where we now have the groundwater and we're able to track the moisture recycling. And we're gonna do a simulation where we uh, say, okay, what happens when we change the current forest to this business as usual deforestation scenario? What I'm showing you here, they're all pretty much the same. Anything that is pink or magenta means less decrease and green is more. So something super important is that the effect depends on the season. So what I'm showing you here is for the dry season. And in the dry season, deforestation leads to less evapotranspiration, right? That's pretty uh, intu intuitive. Higher temperature. And look at how clearly you see the deforested area. So all of this areas are the ones that were deforested in the model. So you have less ET, higher temperature. You have much less water from Amazonian origin. So this is the tracer water vapor. You have a lot less water that came from the Amazon because you're deforesting. And this is changing the recycling ratio. So the amount of precipitation that's coming from the Amazon. But this is the dry season. So First of all, there's not that much water to begin with. And we also don't see a huge change in precipitation. So evidently we're having more moisture coming from the ocean that's kind of compensating for less water from the Amazon. Something very different happens during the wet season. So during the wet season, we do see a decrease in precipitation. And when we first saw this, we said, okay, it has to be recycling. And we have the, the tools to assess what it is. Um, but lo and behold, there is no change in recycling. So this decrease in precipitation is not coming due to less recycling. So when we started digging, we realized that it had to do with stronger winds near the surface, so 10 meter winds due to a less a decrease in surface roughness and an increase in integrated vapor transport. Okay, so what was happening is that, think of it as when you build a channel and you put concrete over the channel, it's just a smoother surface and the water will go quicker. So it's basically the same idea. So you're increasing this, um, vapor transport along the path of the South American low level jet. So you're kind of increasing this water that's crossing through the forest and going into the La Plata Basin. And something important is that, again, the tracers are allowing us to see why this is happening. So we would have assumed that it would be recycling uh, had it not been for the tracers. So as a conclusion for this last part, uh, Large-scale deforestation changes surface roughness, and this leads to changes in the low-level jet. Okay, so in conclusion, you have local variability and change in the land surface that can affect circulation, and I'm interested in these three mechanisms. The first one is moisture. 
how moisture from one region can propagate to a different region. And the implication for this work is that if you have changes in the soil moisture, for example, drought in one region, that drought could possibly propagate to other regions because of this moisture recycling mechanism. The second part of this work looked at sensible heat and how large scale changes in sensible heat, in this case, increased sensible heat, can affect low level jet dynamics. This is pretty new and exciting work in the sense that we're showing a mechanism by which dry conditions can then lead to more precipitation the following month. And the last part of the work kind of circles back to this uh, idea of Amazonian deforestation. Um, and using the tools that, that I showed, we see that um, land use change is affecting precipitation because it affects low level circulation through surface roughness. So these uh, are three possible ways in which the land surface can affect the overlying atmosphere um, at these continental scales. So um, I would like to acknowledge, first of all, my students uh, who have done, you know, 80% of this work, 90% of this work. I am truly thankful for having had a wonderful uh, group of students throughout the years. I'm also very thankful to NSF. Uh, there have been three particular grants that have helped me in this work. Uh, the first one was in 2010 when we began to look at the effect of groundwater, then uh, the, a career award, where we shifted our focus to the La Plata Basin, and more recently in 2016, the Relampago uh, field campaign, which was my first experience with observations uh, in the field. And it was uh, really just an incredible experience. So with that, I will open for questions. All right, thank you so much for that fabulous talk, Francina. Um, usually what we do for questions is, since we're not that large of a group, I just let folks unmute themselves if they'd like to ask. Um, but if you prefer also, you can ask in the chat and I'll, I'll keep an eye on that and read any questions that come through. Sure. Nothing, not even about the video. <laughs> okay. Oh, there's one in the chat. One in the chat, yep. Would you like to read it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Nancy asks, uh, how did you decide to put that music to your video? Very neat. Okay, so uh, yeah, let, let's, let's go back there. So this has been a very kind of long process to get that video of me. So you can imagine, let me see, um, that, so first, we had to do the simulations and that was uh, my postdoc, uh, Zhao Yang, and then analyze the simulations. That was my other postdoc, Jorge Das Barza. And then David Bach, oh, so I, so I contacted David Bach, who's the lead uh, visualization programmer at NCSA. And he is the magician, right? So he did this gorgeous visualization, which we submitted to uh, a conference and then it got the attention of people doing data sonification. So then they contacted David and uh, these three musicians. So uh, Ki Young Lee and ha, ha Young Park are in South Korea and John Mantinga is in Vermont. So I've never actually 
met them personally, but essentially that was how it, it, it happened that we had submitted the video and it caught the attention of people saying, oh, we can we could probably put music to this. And yeah, and that's that's how it happened. So kind of, yeah, a, a snowball effect. Yeah, and it's interesting because you do see kind of like an Asian influence in the music. And that's uh, kind of Ki Young and Ha Young uh, influencing the, the video. Yeah. Alejandro asks, do climate change scenarios and average temperature increases over the Amazon mean higher or lower precipitation downwind? Would there be more recycling due to the higher heat availability or lower due to other impacts? Okay, so yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so the climate change scenarios uh, usually uh, project a drier Amazon. Okay, so in climate change scenarios, that is a kind of a hot spot for um, decreased evapotranspiration from the Amazon. The problem is that the hydrology used in GCMs that are used for climate projections is not great. So um, sometimes I'm I would take those with a grain of salt, essentially, because you know the the most models, not all of them, but most models don't have a good representation of groundwater or roots. And you know, in the Amazon, we're talking about roots that can be ten meters, some even twenty meters deep, to access these deep sources of moisture, and that's just not adequately represented in GCMs. So, knowing that. So it's a, it's a little bit kind of taking the GCM results to understand something about recycling in the future. I'd just be a little bit wary about that. Um, having said this, um, it, is, it is very likely that due to uh, Hadley cell dynamics, you are gonna have a drier Amazon and a wetter La Plata Basin. So this is what we're seeing um, coming out of the simulations that it just makes sense physically. Um, so I, if I had to hypothesize, um, there will be decrease in evapotranspiration and recycling, but likely not to the extent that current GCMs are, are saying. Does that answer the question? Okay. Thank you, Alejandro. I had a question about kind of how ENSO might modulate the effects you're seeing. Would that mainly just change kind of the, the oceanic fraction of water vapor no, actually, so what we what we found uh, was that during El Nino conditions, you have more moisture coming from the Amazon to the La Plata, and during La Nina, it's the opposite. So it does affect the the interbasin transport of moisture. Mm -hmm. um, so so through teleconnections, we are able to see this that that Enzo really does have an impact on on the moisture transport. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are also oceanic things uh, that I I don't remember at the moment, but but just focusing on kind of the land, definitely you have more moisture transport from the Amazon to the La Plata during El Nino. So drier conditions in the Amazon and wetter in La Plata. Mm, okay. Yeah. And vice versa for La Nina. Okay. Very cool. Any final questions out there? So we're almost at five o'clock. All right, not seeing any more in the chat. Well, thank you so much for being here this afternoon, Francina. I really enjoyed your talk. 
Thank you. And uh, uh, I hope thank you for will. the invitation. Yes, absolutely. I hope that we will see you again sometime soon. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone.